Thanks for listening to this archive of Ashbrook and Teaching American History's special webinar for Wednesday, the 18th of November, 2020. Today's program, The Constitution and the Rule of Law, consisted of a conversation between Dr. Jeff Sikinga, Professor of Political Science at Ashland University, and Attorney General David Yost of Ohio. Thanks for listening. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm Jeff Sikinga, the Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center. So glad that you're with us today for our Major Issue Lecture Series webinar with Ohio's Attorney General, Dave Yost. Um, this is part of our ongoing lecture series, and we're so delighted that you could join us in Ohio and across the nation, as we have supporters really everywhere across the nation. And as most of you know, the Ashbrook Center is an independent educational center located at Ashland University here in Ashland, Ohio. Uh, we run programs on campus for high school and undergraduate students in our Ashbrook Scholar Program, but also programs for students, teachers, and citizens really around the country. And uh, it's part of our mission, which is to strengthen constitutional self-government by educating our fellow Americans, whether those are students, teachers, or citizens, in the principles and history of our country. And so we're so grateful that you could join us for uh, an ongoing uh, event in this series, which has been now going on since 1984. Uh, this, the Ashbrook way of teaching and learning, as we call it, is by conversation. We really believe as an educational center that education is not about indoctrination, definitely not, and not even really just about information, but about thinking, about discovering the truth for yourself. And as I always say, we take our idea of education all the way back for, to Aristotle, who said all people by nature desire to, to know, and we add, but they don't wanna to be told. They wanna to discover it for themselves. And we think the best way of discovery is through conversation. So we're gonna have a conversation today um, with Ohio's Attorney General, and feel free to please join that conversation by sending your questions in through the Q&A function. We, I know we have a lot of folks with us and we will have a lot of questions for Attorney General Yost. So we'll try to get to as many of those as we can uh, in the time that we have. Uh, it is our pleasure to be joined by Ohio's 51st Attorney General, Dave Yost. Uh, prior to being Attorney General, uh, which he began his service in 2019, uh, Mr. Yost served as auditor of the state of Ohio from 2011 to 2019. And before that, he was Delaware County prosecutor from 2003 to 2011. So Dave has had a, a long and distinguished career in public service in the state of Ohio, and we thank him for that. And he, he received his bachelor's degree from the Ohio State University in journalism. Uh, I was remarking to him before we came on, I, didn't, I hadn't known he was a journalist. Uh, and maybe even by study, if not by trade. But that journalism degree uh, from Ohio State, and then of course his law degree from Capital University Law School. He's focused as Attorney General on a number of really important issues for the state of Ohio, including uh, fighting the opioid epidemic, uh, fighting human trafficking, and of course consumer protection, among his many other duties and priorities as Attorney General. So Attorney General Yost, thank you so much for joining us. Really do appreciate you being thank here. Thank you for having me. Uh, I thought we'd open up. Uh, the title of our webinar today is The Rule of Law in a Political World. And obviously we are living in the midst of a very partisan world, and especially during election season. But, but there's a kind of contrast with that, which is the law and the rule of law, which is supposed to be impartial. We all know politics is often very partial and partisan, but the rule of law is supposed to be impartial. Help us think through that problem. How, what are the challenges that you face in enforcing the law in an impartial manner in such a political world? And I think um, this is a great question, a great topic uh, for conversation today because of where our country is. Uh, and I really appreciate the Ashbrook Center, uh, as an aside, your role in um, 
promoting the classic values of our constitution, uh, what was once called uh, liberalism and, uh, is diff a little bit different today, uh, is a, a, a critical skill set that has atrophied in, in many parts of our society. So uh, I, I appreciate you keeping the, the flame alive as uh, Gustav Mahler said, uh, tradition is not a celebration of the ashes, uh, but the preservation of the flame. Uh, at any rate, I, I think that it begins with this notion that uh, the rule of law is inherently good uh, and that the, that the exercise of small p politics is inherently evil. Uh, Justice Scalia, uh, in uh, one of his dissents, said that uh, the most important uh, right guaranteed to Americans uh, by the Declaration of Independence was the freedom to govern themselves. Uh, and he said that in, in, a cor in course of discussing uh, how freedoms impinge upon one another and, and uh, you know, trying to think through uh, what, the, what our core values are there. But I think that politics and uh, the rule of law are symbiotic. Uh, the rule of law comes because we used to have royal prerogative uh, and uh, as uh, rulers, uh, became more and more powerful through the growth of the state and the development of standing armies and uh, administrative processes for effective tax collection, uh, there was an increasing desire to curb that power, um, kind of starting uh, with, uh, with the Magna Carta and, and going forward. Uh, but th this is an important issue uh, because we have this tendency in America to view everything as a football game. Uh, we, we want everything to be good versus evil, one side against the other. And what happens is when you have two competing virtues, um, say works and faith and a, uh, a uh, uh, faith-based uh, situation or uh, in a work-based relationship, individual initiative and teamwork, which one's better? Well, they're both important. And so the, the trick uh, is to be able to navigate between the tensions on those competing virtues. Thinking about Scalia's comment, uh, I think we can think of small p politics as being the right to govern ourselves within our constitutional representative system. Um, and the key is to uh, prevent the despotic or autocratic ideas of the royal prerogative um, at the same time uh, recognizing that there are disagreements that uh, maybe don't fall into a specific rigid right and wrong answer. We need to have a mechanism to resolve those things. That's what Congress is supposed to be. That's what representative democracy is supposed to be. Well, so that's really interesting. It's a great way of thinking about it. Really, as you're saying, um, one of our great principles in America, uh, as we always talk about at Ashbrook, is the, the right and the capacity of people to govern themselves. And what you seem to be saying is, and the way we do that in a state like Ohio or across the country is we govern ourselves through the rule of law, so that the rule of law and politics really can go hand in hand. Um, but it is true, isn't it? Can I just push back a little bit on it? Because as attorney general, you must face challenges to impartially enforcing and carrying out the law. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of those challenges that you face in trying to do exactly what you're saying, which is act on the will of the people to govern themselves by you know, the laws they pass through the Ohio legislature? So the greatest is the temptation to arrogate power to yourself because you want to do good. Uh, and a lot of people are uh, surprised when the first question out of my mouth is, what authority does the state or in particular my office have to deal with that? Um, but that's an important part because if you can, if you have no limits on your power, then uh, there is no rule of law. You can do anything that you can articulate uh, a reason for. The, and, and 
uh, trust me, uh, Lord Acton was right, power corrupts. <laughs> uh, and so our system, which is designed to restrain power uh, and its exercise and put guardrails around it uh, is critical. The second thing though is uh, the temptation to do good for your friends. Uh, I resolved this over 20 years ago on my first year of uh, service when uh, someone asked me to uh, do something in my official capacity and uh, I refused. I, at that point I decided that I was going to resolve any conflict of interest between a friend and my duty to the public uh, in favor of my duty to the public. And if there ever came a time when I couldn't turn my back uh, on somebody that I like, admire, uh, uh, call a friend, uh, then it was time for me to resign my office. Um, the third uh, challenge though, which is perhaps the most pernicious today, other than the age old problem of unrestricted power, is the mob mentality that has arisen uh, particularly in academia, but in our society as a whole, where certain ideas are not permitted to be held or even discussed or implied in the, uh, or inferred rather, in the minds of the listener. Uh, the Twitter hate brigade, the um, decredentialing, the deplatforming of unpopular views. Uh, is a tremendous threat, not only to freedom, but to the rule of law. And I've seen instances where uh, citizens in the community are demanding that somebody be prosecuted without evidence. And uh, that's, uh, that way lies anarchy, not the rule of law. And it's incumbent upon all of us that are interested in this, all the people on this call, to be working tirelessly to enunciate, to defend, and to teach why our system of government operates the way it does and why America has been stable and a, a bastion of freedom and economic power uh, for over 200 years. Uh, one of our listeners has asked a sort of follow-up question and yeah. I think a really good one to this, this first point that you raised about the danger of arrogating power to yourself, especially in the executive branch. And the question is, uh, sort of starts with a, a comment, which is that one check on federal power in the last several presidential administrations has been states attorneys generals of the opposite party. Um, can you talk about your understanding of your role as a state attorneys general in um, checking to some degree what you regard as overreach by the federal government or particular administrations? Absolutely. Uh, and it's actually a pretty sophisticated question. You know, at the base level, we are a system of dual sovereignties. In other words, um, the states are sovereign countries, quasi salmon, quasi sovereign countries um, that have an allegiance to the national government that has also been given ascendant or supreme powers delegated by the states. And so it depends which lane you're in. The, the federal government needs to stay in its lane. The uh, powers that were enumerated in the Constitution and given to it, everything else belongs to the states or to the people. And the role of the attorney general is to guard, uh, in part, uh, that state um, quasi-sovereignty uh, to make sure that the federal government stays in its lane. Now, here comes the hard part, uh, because I think everybody, Republican, Democrat, in the middle would go, yeah, that sounds, that sounds right. That's good. We like checks and balances and restraint on power. The temptation is to make an argument, and make no mistake, lawyers are trained to be able to develop new and innovative arguments uh, to support the things that their clients want to do. Uh, and the challenge becomes using the law to uh, bend the judiciary from a dispute resolution branch between parties to a policy-making branch. Uh, and 
we've seen this in the Affordable Care Act. Um, some of my colleagues uh, uh, on the Republican side of the aisle uh, have filed a lawsuit to invalidate the Affordable Care Act because uh, it was only held constitutional on the basis of the idea that the fee, uh, the tax for not getting uh, a health insurance policy uh, was a tax. And so it was under the taxing authority. Well, uh, Congress in 2017 put the tax at zero. And so the argument is, if you have a tax rate of zero, it's no tax because nobody's paying any tax. And they said, aha, that takes away the taxing power and therefore Obamacare is um, dead and unconstitutional. Filed a lawsuit. Ohio didn't join that because as I looked at it, um, my, uh, my reading of the law is that you take out the, the tumor, you don't kill the patient. Uh, and so the individual mandate uh, it was felled, I think, constitutionally by that. But it doesn't impact the rest of the law, which was, whether we like it or not, duly enacted by a, a, a uh, Congress that was elected by the American people. Um, it's, the, the rest of the act, if we want it gone, is a political question that needs to be dealt with with political means. So Ohio, uh, by way of illustration, filed a separate uh, brief saying that while we agree that the individual mandate is now unconstitutional post-2017, that does not reach the rest of the act. The courts don't have the authority to sit as a super legislature and that the remainder of the act should remain in effect until such time as Congress shall choose to amend or repeal. Well, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting nuanced argument, I guess, in favor of um, judicial restraint and in favor of the political branches settling political questions, um, which I think probably is appealing to a lot of folks who consider themselves um, careful adherence to the US Constitution. Uh, that's very interesting. Can I follow up on that though, this question of courts. Uh, in your time as attorney general, in your experience and your broader thoughts on this question, uh, can you talk a little bit about the importance of the courts in upholding the rule of law and what some dangers or problems you see with judicial power? Yeah, the, the, the power, problem with judicial power is the same as all other power that it has a tendency to grow by itself, uh, and to have mission creep, if you will, uh, and it has the potential to corrupt. Um, now, judicial power is unique as against all other powers in that it is virtually unrestrained. While Congress has the ability to establish jurisdictional limits for the Article Three courts, uh, they have very rarely used that power. And while uh, there is a power of impeachment for federal judges, it has only been used uh, historically for uh, really criminal misconduct uh, and very rarely at that. Uh, so once you get a lifetime appointment to the federal bench, uh, other than the possibility that uh, a higher court will overrule you, um, there are in fact very few actual checks uh, on your power. So um, this another question that has come up is, from our uh, audience is the, the federal bench versus the, the, the state uh, of Ohio judges. And of course, one really big difference is that federal judges, as you said, are appointed, as we all know from studying our constitution, judges in Ohio, including for the Ohio Supreme Court, are elected. Um, I, you're not a sitting judge, obviously, but you have been a prosecutor and you've been an elected prosecutor for Delaware County. Um, what challenges or problems does election of judges pose? Is it it's something that we have in Ohio? It's a long tradition in Ohio, but do you see um, any challenges or difficulties with electing judges and maintaining the impartial rule of law? Uh, so let me start by saying, I, uh, having been in both kinds of courts, state and federal, I don't see that there is a clearly superior way of 
having judges. I think there's good and bad federal judges. There's good and bad state judges. In fact, some of the uh, most brilliant jurists I've had the privilege to know have been in the state court. Um, so I don't know that the system is uh, particularly uh, predictive of what you're going to have. With regards to the rule of law, the challenge uh, with elected judges is that they uh, might be tempted to care about the next election more than they care about the rule of law. I think this is a greater problem as you go up the hierarchy uh, because, you know, candidly, the work of a trial bench uh, very rarely has uh, matters that are, are electorally significant. Uh, although I suppose some criminal cases uh, get to that point. Uh, but uh, when you talk about the courts of appeals or, or specifically the Supreme Court, uh, sometimes the stakes can be very, very high. Uh, I think that uh, Ohio has been fortunate that our judiciary has been uh, largely free of um, political pressure uh, and Again, there's exceptions to everything, but by and large, uh, I feel like the judges, even when I disagree with them, are doing their very best to read the law and reach a just and, and proper outcome. I'll also say that I think that uh, our move from four-year terms to six-year terms uh, helped a great deal. Uh, six years is a, a long time for an elective term and helps to space out the uh, periods of jeopardy for someone who uh, has a, a, a career on the bench. Right. But, and how about for your own office? Um, you know, and on the federal level, obviously, the president appoints the attorney general, uh, <laughs> and it's, they're confirmed, of course, by the U.S. Senate. In Ohio, we elect our attorney general, as we all know. Um, uh, what, what challenges does that pose to you? And of course, what challenges does it pose or opportunities does it create for your relationship with the governor and his office? Well, that's a great question. Um, and it starts with the, the question every attorney ought to be asking, which is, who is my client? And in my case, because I'm elected by the people of Ohio, I'm the chief law officer, not of the governor. I am not a member of his cabinet. I'm the chief law officer constitutionally of the state of Ohio. And what that means is my client is the people of Ohio. Now, it gets complicated because the people of Ohio that hired me to represent them also hired uh, a secretary of state and a governor and, uh, you know, treasurer and auditor who uh, all have, or have uh, responsibilities of their own. Uh, and they too answer to the people. So I'm not free to substitute my judgment uh, in a matter that's been entrusted to the governor uh, and say, governor, I don't like what you're doing with X. Uh, I think it ought to be why, and I'm going to go in and sue because of it. On the other hand, uh, it's very possible for a situation to arise where I believe the governor is acting um, illegally uh, and that the law would require me to um, seek the courts to restrain him. Uh, now, I haven't run into that situation. Uh, and it would have to be a clear thing. Again, you can't take your policy preferences and import them into the law. But at the end of the day, my job is to represent all the people, not, the, not just you, not just the thing that you're mad about uh, or that you dislike or disagree with. Uh, maybe the best way of thinking about this, the uh, uh, attorney general under the common law is the trustee of Ohio's natural resources. Um, some years ago, uh, the attorney general mounted an independent action from the governor and the uh, EPA uh, regarding the shoreline at Lake Erie. And uh, that worked its way through the courts. Uh, but there are times when, uh, you know, my client is the people and, and so that's what I'm seeking. Maybe another good example is the 
House Bill 6 in Broglio, where we are in court um, on a civil racketeering case uh, against the, uh, ener the utility players that uh, uh, acted, in my view, illegally. Well, and, and um, this question of relationship between the Attorney General and, and the Governor has come up recently in, in, in uh, our, our neighbor to the north in Michigan. Um, as you know, uh, the Michigan Supreme Court by a 4-3 decision invalidated the authority of Governor Whitmer to issue um, some of the restrictions that she has issued by executive order there. And the Michigan Attorney General, if I'm not mistaken, came out and said, well, in the interim, while this is being adjudicated in the courts or on appeal, uh, I will not enforce this order because the Michigan Supreme Court has declared it to be unconstitutional. Do you think that is, um, is that the kind of proper uh, uh, use of the uh, Attorney General's office? Again, that's the state of Michigan, of course, and not the state of Ohio. But uh, if, and I know no, no attorney ever likes to answer hypotheticals, but if such a thing were to happen in Ohio, what would be the duty of the Attorney General? So first of all, uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into the Michigan case. Uh, that was not a constitutional case. It was a statutory case. And there were two alternative um, statutes. And the first one that the governor acted under had an expiration uh, clause that said, if the legislature doesn't act to, as I'm recalling, to extend uh, the order, then it's void. And they didn't act. And so the uh, order uh, fell on its own accord. The governor fell back then on a more general statute uh, and said, well, fine, I'm going to use this other statute and issue the same order. And the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do an end run around the specific statute that they clearly intended to limit the duration uh, of your order. Um, so that, that was not constitutional. That was strictly a uh, statutory interpretation. Uh, and I, I think probably the, the Supreme Court got that right uh, in Michigan. Ohio doesn't have any uh, such law uh, or restriction on time. And there are a number of people in the legislature who feel that we should have uh, some, some kind of law like that in Ohio. And there's a, a debate going on. And, and that's a matter that's left to the legislature, not to the attorney general. Uh, I don't have a vote. I don't have a veto. So I uh, have the law as it's given to me um, by the people through the Constitution and the legislature through the General Assembly. So then I take it, we do have a question from the audience and you may or may not want to venture an opinion on this, but the question is, does, does the Attorney General have any overarching concerns about uh, the recent uh, uh, restrictions issued by the governor's office um, uh, restricting um, what this questioner regards as the civil, civil liberties of Ohioans? Well, I'm first going to say that, uh, back to my original question of uh, what is the lane of the governor and what is the lane of the attorney general, um, the legislature in Title 37 of uh, the Ohio Revised Code very clearly gave emergency powers to the governor and not to the attorney general. Uh, there are very few limitations on those broad uh, delegation of powers. And uh, until there would be a violation of some constitutional norm uh, that was generally applicable, uh, I don't see that it's appropriate for the attorney general um, to intervene. Uh, now, that being said, uh, I have personal views and personal questions. I, uh, without going into detail, um, don't know that I would make uh, the same decisions that the governor is making, uh, but I am not elected governor. And uh, that's the, the key distinction there. Well, thank you for that. Um, do, uh, another follow-up question on that would be, does the Attorney General's office have any role in promulgating or enforcing um, the orders uh, of Governor DeWine with respect to COVID? 
we have not been consulted in the development of his various orders over the last uh, seven, I don't know, what, eight months now. Okay. Um, you're talking about this difficult balance of holding an elected office as attorney general, um, serving your constituents, as you put it, your, your clients, the, 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 the people of Ohio who have elected you, but doing it in, a, in an impartial, fair way in taking cases and deciding what cases to prosecute, deciding how to, the strategies in court, of course, and then generally in enforcing the law. There must be some really difficult decisions that you face as attorney general in trying to carry that out. Can, if you would, could you tell us what are some of the most difficult decisions that you've had to make in, in your role as attorney general? You know, it goes back to the question of general application. Um, you know, I'll, I'll talk about something that I've been criticized for, and that's the amicus brief that we filed in Pennsylvania uh, on the recount there. Now, for those of that may not have followed that, the legislature uh, in its usual give and take, you know, nature of passing a law enacted abs uh, no fault absentee balloting. Um, didn't used to be the law, now it is the law in Pennsylvania. But one of the things that the, the law that they passed said is the ballot has to actually physically make it to the Board of Elections by the close of uh, the polls on election day. And the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, uh, admitting that it was just making law up, citing its equitable powers, said, no, we, because of mail, because of COVID, we're just going to say anything that comes in for the three days after election day is also going to be fine. Um, well, now think about this for a second. If I showed up at my polling place on Wednesday, am I being disenfranchised because the poll workers aren't there? And if I go to the Board of Elections on Wednesday after Election Day and say, I want to vote, and they say, I'm sorry, the election's over, uh, am I being disenfranchised? And no. Um, so now we move to the Constitution. The United States Constitution says that the electors to the Electoral College that picked the president uh, shall be selected in a manner that uh, the state legislators uh, determine. Uh, well, a court, even a Supreme Court, is not a legislature of the state. And so uh, I filed a brief uh, in that case because although we're not Pennsylvania, and I get that, the question of whether the Supreme Court is permitted to change the legislature's rules under our constitution is one that's going to be, it's gonna come up in the future. And we need an, a, a resolution of this, because if we don't, what's gonna happen is the next election cycle, any swing state is gonna have a Supreme Court case trying to change whatever the rules are to the benefit of one side or the other. And this isn't a Democrat Republican thing. I can easily some of, see some of my partisan friends in the Republican party um, using the same tactics. I think that's a bad thing for the judiciary. It politicizes the judiciary and it makes the rules for our election uncertain and less legitimate, less accepted by the people of the several states. So I'm hoping that the uh, Supreme Court of the United States will give us guidance and either say it's, you know, the, the, the courts, the Supreme Court of a state may overrule the, the legislature. If that's the rule, at least we know what it is. Or as I think is the better uh, reading the plain meaning and the original understanding, uh, it's the legislature, not the governor, not the Supreme Court, not the Attorney General that sets the rules for an election. Well, um, that, that raises a question um, that I think a lot of our students have been thinking about, which is uh, the state of law in Ohio, the reforms, for example, that might need to take place in the law and the way 
the court system runs or in the law. And there have been a number of, of proposals. One that I, I know you know that has uh, gained some traction in other states is a reform movement to reduce or eliminate bail. Um, what, what, if you have an opinion on that, what's your opinion on that uh, particular legal reform? Well, for those who may not be familiar with how bail actually works, in America, if you're indicted or charged with a crime, you're presumed to be innocent until uh, you're proven guilty uh, by proof beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law. Um, and so the idea of bail is just because you got arrested and charged does not mean you're guilty yet. And the only interest that the state has is in making sure you show up for court. Now, in more recent years, uh, there's been a movement to consider safety of the community. So in extreme cases where you have a, a very violent offense, uh, uh, certain kinds of murder, there's the ability to deny bail to a very dangerous defendant uh, pending trial. Uh, but the state has a burden in uh, demonstrating that they are a threat. Well, the fact of the matter on the ground is an awful lot of poor people end up sitting in jail. Um, our courts are packed most of the time. Uh, you get arrested on a Friday night. Um, you may not even see a judge to get a, a bail set until Monday morning. Uh, now you've just had you know two, three days of your life taken away. The judge sets a bail that's high enough that you don't have the means to make it and your family doesn't have a way to pay it. You just sit. Now, what do you do? You know, you're waiting for your trial. It's set six weeks out. And, you know, you're now you've done four week, uh, four weeks and uh, waiting for your trial because you can't make bail. And your public defender comes to you and says, well, look, I can get you a a deal for credit for time served. You just got to, you know, sign here and say you're guilty. Uh, do you want to sit for a couple more weeks, get your trial, and hope that you uh, that you get out, or are you going to take the easy one and walk out the door now? Now, the other side of that coin is I practiced defense law for a while, and almost I had handled several hundred cases. Almost all of them were guilty. Um, the, the idea that we have lots of innocent people to get arrested is, is a fiction. Uh, it does happen. There are people that shouldn't be in jail, uh, but most of them, uh, in fact, uh, are guilty of the crime that they uh, are charged with. So the reform movement is designed to get back to our ideal that you're innocent until proven guilty and to take away this perverse incentive to take a plea, not because you want to admit guilt, but because you see a chance to walk out the door. Now, the places that have done this, the jury's still out. There's a lot of people who uh, don't show up. Uh, and so how you do it's critical. Uh, the most promising bail reforms are increasing the number of recognizance bonds that are issued, but involving a great deal of follow-up with the court system, making sure that um, you keep tabs on where people are and that they know when their court dates are, that you help them get there if they um, you know, end up not being able to get downtown for court date. Uh, and there are some successes there. So bottom line, I'm not for reform eliminating bail. Uh, it's... Uh, worked uh, in large part for you know centuries in our system of government uh, but i do think that there's some adjustments that can be made that will avoid some of the inequities that now indisputably happen no thank you that's uh, very thoughtful uh, I, what about some other legal uh, reforms this summer obviously the question of reform of police and police conduct uh, has been uh, uh, on a lot of people's minds. Yeah. What are some other things that perhaps just even in the state of Ohio that you see as areas that you think would be important for, for us and our elected officials to consider uh, as far as legal reforms? 
Well, if we don't run out of time, I do hope to talk about uh, judicially created deference doctrines like Chevron and Auer or the administrative state. Uh, but uh, the most important thing in Ohio, I think, is two pieces of reform with regard to law enforcement. Uh, the first one is increased annual training. The way we do training now in Ohio, you have to have 737 hours to become a cop. But then there's nothing required unless your agency pays for it or the state pays for everybody. Uh, and not uh, surprisingly, frequently the state just runs out of money as they're going down the priority list until they get to that. And think about it for a second. If you uh, think you've got a kid who's playing basketball, you send him to basketball camp for a couple of weeks or a month, he gets out of that intensive training, he's going to be a lot better, right? But if he goes back and all he does is play street ball for the next two years, and then you put him on the hardwood for a tournament, He's going to freeze up. He's not going to do very well. He's going to be saying, well, what did coach tell me I need to do here? And by that time, the play's passed him. You got to practice. You got to drill. You need regular coaching year in, year out, if you're going to perform at the top of your game. And we owe the heroes of our law enforcement community ongoing year in, year out training. And so uh, I'm looking to the legislature not only to mandate that, but to also pay for it. Uh, Kentucky manages to have a dedicated stream that produces over $60 million a year to do annual training for their officers. We ought to be able to do that too. Um, nobody wants to see a George Floyd tape. Uh, no cop was ever trained to do what Derek Chauvin did. Um, and certainly no cop in Ohio has ever been trained to do that. Um, and that leads us to the second reform which is licensing. I have to have a license uh, to practice law. Uh, I used to be a prosecutor, and attorney general. I can't practice law if I don't have my license and I don't have to commit a felony in order for that license to get suspended or yanked. Um, same with doctors, accountants, uh, plumbers, electricians, even the people that empty the bedpans at, at nursing homes have to have a license. So. I would like to see the state enact a licensing board, just like for all the other professions with continuing education requirements and uh, professional responsibility standards. Uh, I think that that will do a great deal to take away the very, very few people like Derek Chauvin who are the subject of these viral videos. If you've seen some of those going around, that, that's a tiny percentage of the police officers out there vast majority of police officers, and I know thousands uh, across the state of Ohio, got into this because they wanted to be heroes. They want to rescue people. They want to make their communities safer. They want to defuse conflicts and, and make our communities more peaceful. Um, we need to let them do their jobs and get rid of the tiny fraction who either started out bad or went bad. Well, that's a, those are some very interesting ideas. Can you say a little bit more about the relationship that your office has with law enforcement in Ohio? I'm thinking particularly, for example, of county sheriffs. Um, some mm -hmm. folks may or may not know that, but I know that's an important aspect of, of your office. So uh, in Ohio, the ability to investigate a crime or prosecute a crime resides uh, at the local level. I can't go in and investigate hardly anything on my own. Now, I can be invited, and we have the Bureau of Criminal Investigation, which has the state forensic labs, has a cadre of incredible, excellent investigators, some of the best investigators in the country. Um, but we only uh, come in where we can provide expertise or, uh, you know, some other thing that the locals feel will help them. Same with prosecutions. I've got a special prosecution staff and we prosecute cases week in and week out around the country, or around the state. But it's because either there's a manpower shortage in the local prosecutor's office, maybe we have an expertise that they don't have, or maybe a conflict of interest. Um, but we don't run uh, law enforcement uh, like attorneys general and other states do. We support local law enforcement, which makes 
law enforcement more accountable to the local community. The two other things that we do with law enforcement uh, where we have a little more direct impact, one is the Ohio Peace Officers Training Academy, which is our uh, way of training police officers and overseeing local academies uh, is in the Attorney General's office. And the Ohio Organized Crime Investigation Commission is in my office. Again, strong local com component. We use local law offices, uh, officers, uh, but it's where there's organized crime in a multi-jurisdictional uh, kind of setting uh, that we get involved there. Um, as a follow-up to your, your suggestions for some legal reforms, one of our questioners asks, um, is there an argument to be made that you see in your position now to decriminalize drug possession in Ohio and personal use much like Oregon did with Measure 110? Well, I'm not a fan of much of anything that goes on in Oregon these days other than uh, hiking and the making of breed love guitars in Bend, Oregon. But uh, the Fact of the matter is drugs have been, uh, some drugs have been decriminalized in Ohio. The people don't realize this, but since the 1980s, uh, possession of fewer than 100 grams of marijuana is not even a jailable offense. And for those of you who don't use weed, as they call it, they called it pot when I was in school, um, 100 grams is enough for you to get high every day, all day long for a month. Uh, it's several ounces and the potency of marijuana today is very high. So the stories that you hear from other places about, you know, somebody going to jail for 20 years for having a, a joint in their pocket, maybe that's true in a place like Mississippi. It's not true in Ohio. Um, there is a place for decriminalization of small amounts. Um, and uh, Senate Bill 3 uh, is a, uh, and measure that I don't agree with, but that tries to go in that direction. I am for a misdemeanor offense for personal possession. Uh, I don't think addiction should be a felony in Ohio. The trouble that I have is that a lot of the people that advocate legalization or decriminalization um, want to have the uh, felony amounts so high uh, for example, the original version of Senate Bill 3, uh, if you had 49 balloons of heroin in your pocket, um, that'd be a misdemeanor. Uh, folks, I, I, I've come across a lot of heroin addicts. If you've got 49 balloons in your pocket, uh, you're either a dealer or you're dead uh, because uh, regular users are always scrounging for their next fix. Uh, and I, I'm not for that these are extraordinarily dangerous substances that uh, ruin lives. And uh, I, I am not for legalization. You, you mentioned breed love guitars and uh, in, from Oregon. And one of our questioners, uh, listeners actually says that, that uh, he says, I know you are an avid and skilled musician. Um, and avid at least. <laughs> do, does this hobby um, that, that you have play into somehow um, gaining a better perspective on people, on human nature, does it, is it, does it help you in your job as attorney general or is it just a great way to pass some really good time? That's an interesting question. and I'm tempted to say it's just a, a, a way to pass time that I don't have. Um, but for all the students out there, uh, I want you to think about this carefully because science teaches us that our brain operates uh, differently uh, in each of its hemispheres. And, and one side is our creative or, or uh, inductive side. And the other side is uh, rational and analytical. I think that it's really important, especially for those of you who feel that you may be leaders, to develop both sides of your brain. The uh, people who are especially creative and sensitive and live in that side of their brain uh, tend to be very compassionate and really get the impact of public policy on individual lives. And that, that's frequently missing in a lot of our politics. 
but on the other hand, people who live solely in the analytical side tend to fall in love with uh, constructs and, and um, abstract ideals about to describe the world around them and miss the human impact. So uh, I think that the ideal leader um, can write a poem or can write a policy paper. Uh, they can uh, design a home uh, or figure out how to finance it. And uh, on and on, but the uh, important thing there is to recognize that you're uh, a, a whole human being. You need to nurture all of it. Well, I, that goes into a question that we always like to ask folks who join us, um, which is you've had such a, a distinguished career in public service in Ohio and had a lot of time, obviously, to reflect on your experience. And I appreciate what you just said about the importance of, of studying things like music. It's, you know, we have a, a curriculum that we ask our Ashbrook scholars to go through that does a lot with humanities, fine mm -hmm. arts, and things like that. And we always encourage that. It's wonderful to hear. But what advice would you have to students now, whether they're in high school or here with us as undergraduates, thinking about going into a career in public service? I would offer two, I can't say two North Star uh, observations because there's only one North Star, but uh, maybe two immovable points for you. Uh, the first one is to not have immovable points about where your career is going to go. Um, I've seen more people that have planned out the next 20 years of their career, when they want to be where, and then life goes somewhere else. Uh, and especially I have seen people uh, get to be my age who regret the road not taken because they were so fixated on the pre-planned route, they were unable to take a detour or to take a better route. And uh, you're young. Uh, you don't know what you're going to know in 10 years. You won't have lived uh, and gained the wisdom that you'll have in 20 years. Um, Give yourself the freedom to have a couple of dead ends and back up and take another route. But the other thing goes back to how we started this conversation, Jeff, uh, and that is to have the uh, to have an a, a unmoving standard against which you can judge your own conduct. It's so why, as a society. The rule of law is so important, but it's important for individuals as well. You have to have something, a set of principles, a standard to judge yourself that you're not willing to move. Because if you don't, you'll find that you'll end up being willing to do almost anything. The uh, key about the thing about leaders is they tend to be smart, verbal, creative, you'll be able to, you'll get the skills where you'll be able to talk yourself into anything and to argue why it's right uh, if you don't have that external measuring stick. And uh, whatever it is, for me, it's uh, a few central principles of uh, civic life and my personal faith. Uh, but, you know, whatever you choose to, maybe for you, it's the writings of uh, uh, Tupac Shakur. I don't know. Uh, the, you need to have a set of ideas against which you're going to judge yourself. And has there been a moment in your public life where you've, you've had that situation and there's been that conflict and you said, I'm so glad I have the, the, the moral principles of my faith or of my understanding of, of civic life to fall back on? Yeah, I, I mean, almost, uh, I don't know if I'll say weekly, but regularly. Uh, and frankly, I'm going to be candid and I'm not going to dive into my private life and bear my soul here, but I will admit that there are times that I talked myself into doing something that I thought was the right thing because I wanted to do it. And I regretted it. Yeah, I, I think as we as we get older, I think we all have those moments. <laughs> and it's uh, 
real, really humbling to, to hear that from you. And I really appreciate that, uh, your candor. And thank you so much, uh, Attorney General Yost, for being with us today. This has been thank a really you, wide ranging conversation. It's kind of amazing. Our time is, uh, is almost up. So uh, it's, gone, it's gone by so fast. But You're thank you for Jeff, talking maybe. about everything from legal reform and public policy to, you know, music and playing you guitar. A journalist. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us, for taking the time to be with us and to be with our students and our supporters from around Ohio and around the country. I want to want to thank you all for, for joining us. Please um, remember, if there's anything you want to know about Ashbrook and the Ashbrook Center, look us up on ashbrook.org. That's our website. You can find things there. Great resources for students and teachers, including parents who might be schooling their their kids at home now can be found on teachingamericanhistory.org or tah.org. So look at those two websites. You'll be sent a link to uh, the recording of this uh, webinar with uh, Attorney General Yost. Please, uh, we would love to get, have you send that out, share it with your friends and family uh, who have a chance to hear what the Attorney General has had to say today. And, and thank you so much for being a part of this conversation, all of you who submitted questions. I'm, I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to get to all of them. There's so many good ones, but I do appreciate your willingness to engage in that kind of conversation and discussion uh, with Mr. Yost. And uh, that's really what we think we're doing here at Ashbrook, having a conversation that sheds light on the issues that we face as human beings and as citizens of, of the United States and of the state of Ohio. We really think that that can help us deepen our understanding of the questions that we have to answer as human beings and citizens, and it can help direct public life in a state like Ohio. So, so thank you for joining us for that conversation. We appreciate it. And uh, of course, there'll be more in our major issue lecture series. We'll keep you all apprised of that. In the meantime, please stay healthy, stay safe, and as I always say, stay hopeful and stay connected with Ashbrook. Thank you for joining us. Thanks again for listening. You can learn more about our free resources for teachers and students of American history and government at teachingamericanhistory or tah.org.